Sean Korn, and I am a yoga teacher and the co-founder of Off the Mat Into the World. All right, I'm here with a, a new up-and-coming young yoga teacher, <laughs> uh, Sean Korn. Yeah. Sean with an E, Korn without an E. Korn like the vegetable. That's right. And uh, we go way back, but not way, way, way back. So I was wondering, you've shared a lot in your classes over the years, and it's always a delightful story. I always have this image of you, a waitress, and with Allen Ginsberg and, mm -hmm. you know, the bartending at the the okay. intense uh, club yes. and your your Heaven. best buddy who was like the big I don't remember <laughs> apparently none of the story landed why don't you let me tell the story I'm known for my looks on my brains <laughs> but so give us a little bit of life story of, or sure. give me I should say I'll give you my life the little life story yeah okay well you know I was born and raised in New Jersey and I moved to New York City at 17 and I moved because I didn't do very well in school. I didn't get into college. I couldn't have gotten to college if I wanted to. Hmm. And, but I didn't want to get stuck in New Jersey. So let me touch on that. So mm -hmm. you're obviously smart, yes. but you just weren't that motivated about school. Oh, I didn't. You were a troublemaker. I was, I was popular. Uh -huh. I was popular and social, but I uh -huh. did not care about the rest of it. And um, just kind of get, got by on what I could, but I really didn't do well in school. And so when I graduated, I knew that college wasn't an option. But I knew if I hmm. stayed in Palms and Lakes that I just knew my destiny. Hmm. You know, it, I was I just saw that what was about to happen. And so I moved to New York City with no skills, no education. What do you do? You work in nightclubs. Hmm. And that was really my life for many years was working in nightclubs as a door person, bartender, hostess, you name it. I've done it. You're a bouncer. Uh, I've done door. I wasn't a bouncer, yeah. but a door person. Yeah. I got to pick the people who were uh -huh. allowed into the wow. club. Yeah, you would right. not like right. that. No. no cowboys. No. Um, I thought gay cowboys were pretty big <laughs> in the 70s. I mean, I could uh, be this pretty... Was, this was the 80s. Uh -huh. and yeah, yeah, actually. Um, so, uh, anyway, one of the first jobs that I did get was at a place called Life Cafe, which was on the corner of 10th and Avenue B. This was in 1985. And why a lot of people are, are, are often intrigued by this story was because my boss was David Life. David went on to open up the Jiva Mukti Yoga Schools. Sharon Gannon, his partner, who also went to open the Jiva Mukti Yoga Schools, was a waitress there. Eddie Stern, who went on to open the Ashtanga Yoga Shala, was a delivery boy there. Huh. Um, Dana Flynn from Laughing Lotus was a customer. And um, so I started working there. Now, Life Cafe, back in the 80s at that time, it was, it was a, a hangout of artists, poets, politicians, drug addicts, you name it, they showed up at this place. And my very first day on the job at Life Cafe, um, I, my first customer was a woman came in, sat, ordered, ordered a cup of coffee, asked for the bathroom key, um, went to the bathroom, 5, 10, 20 minutes goes by, she doesn't come out, and I ask my manager, Sadiq, uh, what should I do? And he says, your customer, your problem. Mm. Yay, Sadiq. Mm. Um, and so I had an extra bathroom key. That's a good yoga teacher lesson too, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, the, yeah. the outcome though was I knock on the door, no one's answering. So I use my key, I open the door, and I see her on the floor with her pants and her panties down to her ankles and a rig in her arm. Mm. She had overdosed, passed out onto the floor, and had to call 911, had to deal with mm. all of this, get her out of the restaurant while dealing with other customers. And that was my first introduction to the Lower East Side Life Cafe in the 1980s. And I worked there for five years. And then I have to say this, mm -hmm. and this doesn't have to be on camera, but however many years later, 30, 20 years later, what happened yesterday? <laughs> well, you know, yesterday we had someone have an experience in the classroom, you know, that was a little bit of an emergency for her. Um, went on, uh, passed out unconscious and had to hold space for both yeah, uh, what was for someone a, a true emergency, yet at the same time make sure that the rest of the space was calm and present, and do simultaneous jobs. Um, so yeah, I was kind of been prepared for that for a long time. And that's a um, fundamental life lesson, right? How do you take care of everyone around you while? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you multitask in mm -hmm. a way without losing your mm -hmm. you your heart and your mind and <laughs> you yeah. breathe and you pray. Well, so Life Cafe. Um, so David was one of the only 
real adults in my life at that time, and he was only in his 30s, if you can imagine. He had long blonde hair. He wasn't a yogi at that time. David was an artist and amazing. He was actually like the grandfather of the Lower East Side art scene back in that time in the East Village and famous for his artwork. And the cafe was so cool. And Sharon was the toughest waitress ever. If you didn't marry the ketchup or the salt and, sh- the salt and pepper at the end of a shift, you had to deal with Sharon. She was strict. And it's where I learned about vegetarianism. It's when I gave up meat. This was, would have been in 1987. The whole restaurant, I imagine, was... No, it wasn't. No. It became slowly. Mm. Um, and I remember there were options on the menu at that time that had chicken. I remember, yeah, it was not a vegetarian restaurant. Mm. But slowly, as David and Sharon got into yoga and Eddie Stern, everything started to change a little bit. There was an enormous amount of drug use being done in the cafe itself. Mm. Um, we used to, on our own shift, it was so disgusting when I think about it, we would cut up lines of coke and lay it out on the, in the bathroom, on the toilet, like, you know, the toilet, yeah. whatever that is. The lid. Lid. Yeah. We'd cut up lines of coke on the toilet and just put a bowl over it. And one by one, we would just take turns going in there, doing a line of blow off of the lid of the toilet and then going back to work. Wow. You would have people. So service was pretty. <laughs> we were on it. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, you'd have the bartender doing something and then all of a sudden leaning over the garbage can and vomiting and wow. going then getting back to work was a heroin. And it was intense and fun. And David and Sharon got really into yoga in a big way and I remember them going off to India. And when they came back, David was the one I remember being so, something had shifted in him. David's always been a mellow, yeah. loving, grounded guy. And he taught me some of my very, very, first deepest lessons of compassion in that restaurant. So he'd always had that in him, mm. but- Like how so? There was a girl that used to work at the restaurant who was a bus, uh, a bus person. She was, she used to dance for the butthole surfers. Do you remember that? Yeah. Part? Okay. So when I say dance, she used to stand naked on the stage. Wow. And that was her kind of side gig. And this is how she made money. And she was, she was like, I don't know how to explain it. Remember, I'm, I'm 19 years old. She's mm. probably 17. And David overheard me being not nice to her, just kind of, I think maybe even bullying a little bit. Mm. And David pulled me aside and he said that I was always going to have opportunities in my life because I was social and educated in a lot of ways, you know, just in, in life and presentable, you know, that, that I was always going to have opportunities uh, and life was always going to come a little easier for me. And because of that, he would expect me to look around and see who wasn't going to have that mm. and be that much kinder, that much nicer, that much more supportive. And I remember, I know exactly where we were standing mm. when he was telling me this and I felt all this shame, but David wasn't making me feel shame, mm. ashamed. Mm-hmm. He was just kind of saying like, honey, mm. Wake up here. You, and that's you, so powerful to do it without making you feel bad. Mm-hmm. This is all to make you want to. Mm-hmm. He was just reflecting back, like you, you, you're amazing, and have you're going to always have gifts and opportunities and privileges, essentially. Mm-hmm. And there are some that aren't going to because mm-hmm. of whatever their circumstances are, and the the onus, the responsibility is going to be on people like me, to to reach and to connect and to never diminish someone else. And that was a deep lesson for me. And um, that's one of many. And David would, David would give up a whole corner of the restaurant to the, the homeless population on the Lower East Side. They'd come and play checkers and just live on coffee all day long. And if you were stuck in that section, you weren't going to make any money. But David was never going to kick them out. He, he was very, very generous. Now their, their last refuge, as you probably know, if you read in the Times, is McDonald's, and they're getting kicked out of that McDonald's in Times Square. New York is getting yeah, so yeah, yeah. unfriendly to that. Yeah, yeah, which is very interesting. Yeah. But they're the ones who introduced me to vegetarianism mm-hmm. and to yoga. And essentially, there was a period where David came back, and he was just over the drug use. He was over just the, the dynamics in this restaurant and made it really clear that... Like if you weren't, if you were interested in doing drugs, you didn't have a job there. And if you were interested in opening yourself and and learning other things, then you can work. And I stopped doing drugs. I stopped. Like completely or just when you were there? I, no, it was gradual. It was gradual. I stopped doing drugs first. I stopped because I was doing coke. I stopped doing drugs 
and then I stopped drinking, then I stopped eating meat, then I stopped smoking cigarettes. Like it was a progression, but it really had a lot to do with their influence, uh, especially David, over me at that time, because like I said, he was the only grounded adult figure in my immediate vicinity. He was like your New York City father. Kind of. I, I always uncle. knew that if I ended up in jail, David was who, was who I was going to call, mm. you know, to bail me out. Mm. Um, and, but then one day, five years in, out of nowhere, David calls me and fires me. Mm. And we had a long talk on the phone. It was the best gift, you know, he had ever given me. I was very attached to the family and that job and being there. And basically he was saying, this, this can't be forever for you. Like, like go. you've got yeah. to enough. And I, I was freaked out at first because it was, there's so much security, you know, and we were also all of us skimming off the top, eating, like it was, it, what we were doing in that restaurant yeah. was just so, sorry, David, it was just so horrible. And, but it was still my home, my family, my security. Yeah. And then David called me and fired me and best gift hmm. he gave me because it, hmm. it was one of the, the, the events where I had freedom, where I thought, hmm. I think I'm going to move to Los Angeles and really get into yoga. The so you had already connected with yoga by that time? Oh, yeah, 24 yeah, yeah. Or... yeah, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I had started yoga in 1987. And so, uh, yeah, by this time, I'm probably three years into my practice. Okay. Um, yoga, meditation, and um, working with a Zen Buddhist therapist. And so I'm pretty... That's a huge momentum shift, like from Coke on the toilet lid and, you know. Yeah. Part of, I, I and you know you haven't talked about like working in the clubs. You had a dear friend who died, right, yeah. or a customer or something. Yeah, uh, I had many dear friends that yeah. died. Remember, this is the '80s. Right. So unfortunately, there were a lot of people that I loved and lost during that time. Mostly, they were mostly gay men and mostly gay men of color mm -hmm. um, that I had a real relationship with at that time. Gay men loved me, mm -hmm. and I loved them right back. And but during that time, there was there was a lot of stigma. There was no cure, obviously there's no cure today. Um, and the medicine that was being given was so toxic. It, the medicine was killing a lot of these people. And so I lost a lot of people. And I think that it also wisened me a little faster. And also being in the clubs, it was during the time when, do you remember the club kids scene with Michael Alig and there's been movies? Mm. I worked at Limelight for a while and Michael Alig was one of the promoters. He ended up murdering this guy Angel and went to jail for it, cut his body up, threw him in the Hudson. And he was just this flamboyant little club kid. And it was the time when ecstasy and uh, uh, Special K and all these really hardcore drugs came out into the scene. And I still love to work at clubs, but at this point I am sober, I'm a vegetarian, I'm doing yoga. I like to see it, like I'm this cosmic voyeur, but I had no interest in touching it. And it got dark really fast. Maybe it was always dark, you know, but to me, the days in Danceteria and area and all those great clubs, that was just, a, it was a different time when it turned to these more, these, these drugs that were, I, I don't even yeah, know how to describe hardcore. them. Hardcore. It just got darker, uglier, mm -hmm. and I wanted out. Mm -hmm. I didn't it wasn't about fun, kind of. It, it was a different kind of fun. It was just a fun, I, maybe I got too old. Yeah, yeah. It was like right. cartoon character, hallucinogenic fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a different level of sexuality that was, uh, but there's something kind of cool. There's a lot of experiment, creative experimentation. I didn't participate in that though, like I witnessed. But at that point I had worked in 11 different nightclubs and wow. I had, I loved that whole environment, but yeah. I was sober in that environment. Yeah. And so I got to play, but safely, while at the same time learning about yoga and all these other, just these other methodologies to help keep me grounded. Although I didn't probably think about being grounded at that time was all leading me somewhere. Hmm. So you go to LA, you go west. I go west. To find, to make your fortune. <laughs> yeah. And, and how did you become a, were you a yoga teacher at that point? No, yeah. no, no, no. I go, I moved to Los Angeles and my first job in Los Angeles is a delivery girl doing, um, working, delivering food from high end restaurants. Now I'm new to LA and it's a little overwhelming. You don't have GPS, you mm -hmm. have Thomas guide. I had that job for maybe 10 days and I had to wear a little top hat huh. and uh, like a, a bow tie and then I would deliver the food if I could find the place. I had to give them a rose. 
awful. Huh. Didn't last there. Worked in a couple of different nightclubs while I was there. And where were you living? I was living in Los Feliz. And the mm -hmm. reason I moved to Los Feliz was because it meant the happy. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that would be a good place to live. Plus it was affordable. And it was kind of the East Village of the, you know, mm -hmm. as close as it can get. Um, but it was a younger crowd. So I, I'm kind of exploring the yoga scene there. But there isn't really quite a yoga scene. You know, it's, it's still kind of spread out. There's only one Yoga Works. Um, but I don't know about Yoga Works yet. I'm at the Self-Realization Fellowship, which is in Santa Monica, and I'm just walking around by myself. And I stop in the bookstore, and I ask the woman, do you know of a local yoga school? And she says, well, my daughter goes to this place called Yoga Works on Montana and 15th Street. And so I remember driving up Montana and looking for it, and I see it, and I pull into the driveway. And I often think about that now, because that turn changed my entire life. I went up that driveway and I went into the school and, you know, trying to navigate what, uh, there was people and it was a different energy, not like New York. There was, you know, there wasn't a scene yet in New York. And this was different. There was different kinds of bodies. Hmm. And the first person I saw was the woman who became my boss and my mentor, Mati Azrati. She's sitting on the couch and she's got all this armpit hair and this long braids. And I was kind of taken by her and then there was this six foot tall blonde woman her name is Sita and doing a handstand against the wall wearing like hot pink leggings and a, and a sports bra and wrist guards I you're like awesome I I just didn't know this world yeah. but I had no money and I couldn't afford yoga classes hmm. and so I took one class and someone told me that you can get a job behind the you can volunteer behind the desk at yoga works and they would um, give you uh, free classes and that's what I did. I got a job volunteering, stuffing envelopes, you know, making phone calls. And for every hour that I worked, free class. And finally, they hired me to be the receptionist behind the desk at Yoga Works. And during that time, I start dating a yoga teacher by the name of Brian Kest. Mm -hmm. And just a little yoga teacher, right? <laughs> and those, some of those videos are, we've blogged those very successfully <laughs> of you and yes. him and all that. It was a great time. And yeah. Brian was like, the first real, like, local celebrated yoga teacher. His classes were packed. They were fun. Yeah. He brought so much of his personality into yeah. the room. I'd never seen that before. Charisma, yeah. Charisma, soul, yeah. humor. He, he was very alive. His classes were what crazy. What year is this? 94. Uh-huh. And... Because the, these videos completely, he was like the Chris Cornell or like Eddie Vedder of yoga. He was like strutting around in cut-off jeans and like... I think he had a hairy chest and he was like mm -hmm. drawling in his kind of deep whatever accent. Michigan. Michigan. Detroit. Yeah, Detroit. Detroit. Those are good videos though. Yeah. Um, well, Brian was amazing. He was great. And we go for a hike and out of nowhere, Brian says to me, you are the only other person I would love to see t teach power yoga other than myself. And no one had ever said that I should be a yoga teacher. It was the first time. And have you thought about it? No, no, no. Not in even a little bit. I thought you had to be doing yoga for, you know, 20 years before you even consider something like that. It was mm -hmm. so out of my realm, you know. And then the uh, very next morning, I'm working behind the desk, and Mati says to me, she said, there's a teacher's training coming up, and I think you should do it. I think mm -hmm. you'd be a good yoga teacher. And uh, so two people within a 24-hour period are, are encouraging me to do this. And I call my parents up, because I can't afford it. And it's six hundred dollars for a two hundred hour, two hundred hour training. It's with Eric Schiffman, and I'm telling my parents about it. My parents, I had never asked my parents for money, and not since I left home. And I told them about this training and what I wanted to do. And my parents, before I even had to ask, they offered it up. They said, you know, why don't we, you let us give that to you for your birthday? And to this day, my mom said it was the best check they ever wrote. Yeah, six hundred bucks. Right. But I sucked. I was awful. It was a horrible experience. Um, and I found out that I had a terrifying fear of speaking publicly. Hmm. And it wasn't what I thought. I would freeze if I had to engage with more than a couple people at any given time. Hmm. And I got through my entire teacher's training without actually having to teach in front of the class. Huh. And So how did you work with that? Um, it was hard because everyone's telling me I'm going to be an amazing yoga teacher. But the only evidence they had was strength and flexibility. That's not 
a, what a te- you don't. So they were saying it based on your form and yeah. your practice. Yeah. And but also probably your heart or personality or maybe. Yeah. But there's a skill to teaching. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a skill and to being able to engage people and, and articulate information. It's something that I think you know I had organically, one on one. But then to organize it, fine tune it, it, it wouldn't connect. The mm-hmm. anatomy wouldn't connect. Mm-hmm. Eric Schiffman said to me, a yoga teacher is someone so filled with yoga that it overflows. Mm -hmm. I felt that about myself when I would talk with someone about yoga one-on-one. But as soon as a group of people would look at me, I would get dizzy. Mm -hmm. Things would blacken around the corners Mm -hmm. and I would lose my train of thought. And so I was really sad because I thought I'm not going to be a good teacher. I, I don't have what that takes. And it all changed for me. The neck, I took an, I don't know why but an advanced Iyengar training with uh, Lisa Walford. And I got through that training without teaching anybody. I mean, I made myself invisible. That's how terrified I was. Mm. I think I was more terrified of finding out the truth that, you know, once I opened my mouth, it would be affirmed that I can't do this. And by avoiding it, I didn't have to take that risk. Right. So I go into this advanced training. It's our, it's our teach, it's our um, final exam. At that time, the way you were taught, the mats were set parallel to the front of the room and you had to go up and teach a pose. And I remember standing in Tadasana, praying to God that the pose that Lisa asked me to teach wasn't Parsvakanasana. She's saying, please God, don't let it be Parsvakanasana. And of course, Sean teach Parsvakanasana. So I get up to the front of the room and the mat is set up, you know, across, like I said, it's all parallel and you have to mirror meaning that you say one thing, but your body does the opposite. Right. I've never done this before. My mentor, Mati, is sitting in the corner watching. Lisa Walford is watching. All my peers. They no, all... no pressure. I get up, take a deep breath. I say, spread your legs five feet apart. Turn your right foot out as I turn my left foot out. Arms out to the sides. Take another deep breath in. Exhale. Bend your knee, right knee. Take another deep breath in. And as I reach my hand towards the floor, it was as if someone had reached into my brain and didn't just take out the next line. Any word that has ever been spoken, it was just gone, I blank. Yeah. I'm staring yeah. at my hand, I'm staring at the floor. I know something has to happen yeah. to make these two points connect, but I can't say it. Yeah. My worst nightmare is happening. Yeah. So I straighten my leg, I giggle nervously. I say, can I try that again? She says, of course. Take a deep breath in, spread your legs apart, right foot out as I turn my left. Another deep breath in, bend the knee, inhale. And as yeah. I lean forward, the same thing happens. Just a little bit of panic or... I freeze. Yeah. I choke, I freeze. Yeah. My peers are pointing to their hand, touching the oh. floor. They're trying to like... Yeah. I freeze. I straighten my leg and I go to say something and my voice cracks. And Lisa, God bless her, she looks at me and she goes, Oh, Sean, you're nervous. And my face gets beat red and I can feel the tears are about to come. And then the next moment changed my life. And the next moment was I turned to her and said, Lisa, can I try something different? And she's like, go ahead. Yeah. And I stepped off the mat and I walked into the room. Mm. And all of a sudden, once the attention was off of me mm-hmm. and I became a part of the energy, the words just came out of me. They flew out of me. And I remember both teaching and thinking simultaneously that I'm a teacher. Mm. I, I'm a teacher. I, I like felt you're good it. at this. Yeah. It flowed. Yeah. And the words, I was grabbing them everywhere. And I was ignited after that. After mm. that, And now I did five 200 hours back to back mm. because I retained zero, the first one. The second one, 20%. But mm. the time I did my fifth, uh, I was already teaching during that, but I was doing teacher's training simultaneously to teaching because I knew I had a, I didn't have the same kind of skill. Um, capacity to retain information the way other people did and I needed I needed to repeat it again and again practice yeah and from there it just kept evolving and growing and eventually Mm. Mati fired me from behind the desk Mm. I kept one one little shift because I was so afraid that the yoga teaching wasn't gonna work out now my classes are packed I'm doing great but I would sub this Sunday this Sunday shift every week Mm. for almost a year and finally Mati's like you're fired she said, if it doesn't work, this teaching thing, you can always have your job behind the desk back. Mm. And when she said that, I was like, okay, I can, I can so let that sweet. go. Yeah, yeah. So supportive. That's my, that was my little backstory. 
Hmm. That's great. Well, but that's not the end. I mean, so then this is the beginning, you know, yoga's on the cover of Time magazine and mm -hmm. whenever that happened in like 2000 and the whole yoga thing blew up and the yoga conferences and um, for the first time we had this celebrity yoga mm -hmm. teacher phenomenon. Yeah. And you were a part of that. Maybe yeah. not the first wave. There had been famous yoga teachers, but contemporary in, in the contemporary yeah. yoga scene in this kind of celebrity yoga, yogi, yeah. whatever they call it. Uh, yeah. Celeb yogi. Yeah. You know, it when in 1994, I did the cover of my first uh, yoga book, which is Moving Into Stillness mm -hmm. with Eric Schiffman. I'm the girl in a headstand on the cover. You can't see my face, but the, mm -hmm. you can see my toes spread. And that was a big deal. Um, and then I did Brian's videos back to back. And what year? Oh, that was 90. That was 95. 95. 95. I did Brian's videos. I think it's 95. Yeah. And then in 95, I also did um, the Today Show with Matt Lauer. Hmm. And I was invited to do that by Maria Shriver. I had been teaching her and she hmm. said, I would love for you to go on TV and talk about yoga. And, hmm. and it, that really hadn't been done at this time, like on that kind of a mainstream level. And they flew me to New York. I am six months out of a teacher's training, my first one. I know nothing about yoga. I'm up all night long thinking, what is yoga? I'm trying to anticipate what they're going to ask. If you ever see the footage, and I hope you never do, the, we're standing there, he and I, and the, it's action and it's live. And he says, Sean, so, and he asks me a question that has nothing to do with what I was anticipating. And the look on my face is, I hear four of the words, the rest of it just goes by. I stumble through the most lame response. He asked me something about why it's good for your health and wellness, something like that. And I said, I end it with, it's good for your quads. And I just stop. <laughs> and thank God he's such a uh, pro because yeah. he just jumped right yeah. on it. And the next question I was a little bit more present to. Right. And the look on my face is like, oh, I got this one. Right. At the end of it, he says to me, Sean Corn, fascinating stuff. And I'll forgive you for calling me tight and weak. And I was like, huh? And when I rewatched yeah. the footage, because I was teaching him yoga, I refer to him as tight and weak multiple times <laughs> <laughs> throughout the entire little uh, session. Could be true though. It I was, mean, and it was ridiculous. Right. But yeah. from there, uh, I started. I started to get opportunities that other people didn't get, mm. and and it wasn't because I was a skilled or talented teacher. No one who comes out of a yoga teacher's training is skilled and talented. Mm. Um, I became skilled and talented. And it would be an insult to the teachers who have worked with me tirelessly for the last 20 years to suggest otherwise. Mm -hmm. I know I'm a good yoga teacher and it's because of the guidance that I've had from my teachers. But back then, I was not a good yoga teacher. I'm linking poses, I'm putting flash before substance. You know, I'm part of the new, the new vinyasa flow power yoga phenomenon that's happening in Los Angeles, which is basically until someone's in what I used to call um, a yogic fetal, um, yogic uh, roadkill. You were in a fetal position on your side. It wasn't a successful class until at least one person kind of collapsed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had uncle. To beat them into submission. Yeah. That was success. Probably not a good measure for success, but yeah. that's really how immature I was in my teaching, in my, the, my development, and yet, I was getting invited to do a um, cover of Yoga Journal. This would be back in 1998 or 99. And at that point, I have a little bit more of a local following. But the reason I was very well aware that the reason that I was getting these opportunities, the books, the videos, the, the, the editorial, the Today Show, any interview that came through, they were always going to come to me, was because I was marketable. Mm -hmm. and in a time where yoga was just starting to be, to dance in the mainstream, they weren't going to put someone in the mainstream who wasn't accessible. And I'm Eurocentric, ethnically neutral, white, skinny, athletic. I was so sellable. And so I knew right away, like, oh, so this is how it's going to be for me compared to my friends who were more skilled, more talented, maybe even worked harder. But because I fit into this, um, the standardized ideal of sellable beauty, I was going to, it was going to allow me uh, um, a platform mm -hmm. that others wouldn't get. And I struggled with that because I knew once I said yes to these opportunities, I'm now complicit 
in perpetuating these ideals that as someone who's always been uh, a part of elevating people, elevating conversations, being a social activist, which I have been since I was 18 years old, I knew I'm now part of the system. You're part of the man, you're part of the yeah. machine. Yeah. Perpetuating this yeah. privilege. Yeah. And there was a part of me that didn't want to, and I also realized they're gonna get someone. And if they are, they're probably just gonna get some skinny white model. At least I can try to the best of my ability to use the platform that I'm getting and try to change something, have a deeper conversation, broaden the awareness. Now, at first I couldn't do that, but in time, I definitely, the positionality gave me an enormous amount of power to be able to have conversations that have led to Off the Mat Into the World, Game Changers, all the work that I've been doing over the years is a direct result of taking advantage of that privilege, mm -hmm. but not denying the privilege. Mm -hmm. So my experience in the mainstream yoga world has been very unique to me. And I got a lot of support from my mentors and teachers encouraging me. And who were some of those? Eddie Modestini, uh, Sharon Gannon, David Life, Mati Azrati, uh, Chuck Miller, Lisa Walford, Patricia Walden. Uh, these are the people that if I made a mis misstep, they would, even if they didn't know me very well, they knew my opportunities. They also knew my heart. And if I made a misstep, they would call me up and, and not chastise me, but question mm -hmm. and ask me uh, my perspective and encourage me to think broader, bigger. I got a lot of support and a lot of guidance by a lot of these teachers over the years behind the scenes. And there a lot of, some of them are not even my teacher personally but they just cared cared and yeah. they cared about yoga and yeah. they also recognized that i was a young and contemporary voice and they wanted to make sure that mm. they, they supported me in ushering it in as well and as effectively as i could mm. so you know it was it, it was a, a very interesting world los angeles in the 90s when all of this was erupting the mainstream yoga popularity, uh, the celebrity, working with celebrities. It was crazy at that time, all the different celebrities that would come into the room, the photographers outside the classroom. It's getting featured in magazines. When I would do privates, because I worked with a lot of celebrities at that time, I would come out of people's houses in the morning and there would be vans of people photographing me until they realized that I was the yoga teacher. And after a while, they would see me and wave. I would wave and you know get in my car. Um, but it was a very weird time as yoga was evolving in Los Angeles, and I was it was exciting to be a part of it. Yeah. And you know it just continued to evolve from there, and eventually I went national because of Yoga Journal and Omega and Kripalu. Um, I had a very big following in Los Angeles, and it just started to expand out. So how did you deal with that? I mean, people are still dealing with that. I just interviewed an Instagram yoga celebrity. Like, how do you deal with when someone comes to you? Because we've talked about this privately many times. Someone comes to you, some huge company with an offer, and they can pay your way for a year or two. Yeah. And you don't feel good about that product. How do you negotiate that? I mean, especially when you're younger. Well, it's different now for me because, again, I have, I have a lot of power and like, you know, I still have a lot of power in the yoga community where I can pick and choose in a very different way. And I can actually challenge companies. If they really want to work with me, they have to change certain policies. Otherwise, I can't and won't. But back in the day, I didn't have that kind of power. And I think I'm also, I probably might be one of the first uh, yogis at that time to have corporate sponsor sponsorship because I worked with Nike. And that would have been in 19, also maybe 99. Um, Nike was doing a campaign, and it was an excellent campaign, of featuring uh, athletes who were as dis uh, amateur athletes around the country who had the same discipline as the professional athletes, but you just didn't see them or know of them. And it was the first time they were featuring yoga as one of these disciplines. They had boxers, and they had everything, and yoga. And it was a huge campaign. I was even featured with... Uh, Mia Hamm and Lance Armstrong at some Olympic game in one of their commercials. And, but it's Nike. And Nike at that time had a real uh, suspect sweatshop policy. And I was very well aware of it and knew if I work with them, 
I am a part of this, this, this machine. I'm a part of this exploitation, this oppression. But if I don't work with them, I can't have a conversation. It was a really double-edged sword for me. And I knew that the yoga community was going to have a huge mm. issue if I did. But if I didn't, they would just find someone else. And I knew Forbes, New York, New York Times, all these magazines would want to interview me because it was definitely highlighted, this yoga piece. And at first they were going to ask me about the, capital, the corporation, the corporization of yoga, capitalization within yoga, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually they were going to ask, well, how can yoga change my life? Right. And there's my platform. And it's mm -hmm. exactly what happened. And, and I, even how can, you know, how, how does the Nike need to change a little mm -hmm. bit? Well, media wasn't asking me that question, right. but... Nike started asking questions with yeah. me about what do I think the yoga community would want to see more. And yo uh, Nike was one of the first companies that made a non-PVC yoga mat. Yeah. Uh, as per my suggestion, it was yeah. horrible. It just peeled off in right. your hands. But they actually did it. And, and that's huge for people who don't remember that time. Every mat, yeah. the, literally the foundation of yoga was this toxic, and still yeah. is in many cases, polyvinyl chloride or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bad stuff never goes away, causes cancer, all this. Yep, it was a big deal. And yeah. they, they really brainstormed with me about these different ideas. And, you know, again, there was no big, Lululemon didn't exist, you know, mm -hmm. none of the Athletica. Mm -hmm. These companies weren't branding to yoga. So they were really curious. Mm -hmm. And and that's in one of the conversations I said, if you really want to work with a yoga company uh, community, here's the issue you're going to have, is they're going to want to know where their clothing is being made. They're going to want to know what materials are being used and where do these materials come from. These questions are going to have to come up and it's going to have to be transparent. And that some yogis might not care, but some will. Yeah. And that conversation happened and probably didn't influence anything. Yeah. But it became a practice ground for me in being able to work with corporations and challenging the conversation about mindfulness yeah. within the corporate structure. So working with Nike was incredible, incredibly po um, positive. And, and yet, you know, it's this odd balance of being in the mainstream, working within these corporate structures and being a really committed yogi personally. If I turn my back, nothing changes. If I go towards it, nothing still may change. I get it. I mean, but, it's interesting that so much of the yoga community still doesn't care like Lululemon, you know, made yeah. in China, mm -hmm. plastic yep. stuff. Most yoga clothes, not just to pick on Lululemon. Yep. Um, and the only tr thing transparent about Lululemon, famously, was their uh, the, <laughs> yeah. the, their tushes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but hopefully, you know, part of the conversation when you go up to the marketplace is there are the inner waves, organics, and yeah. yeah, yeah, it's happening. And in the organization, off the mat into the world, I part of the way in which I funded off the mat. Uh, over the years. So this was the organization you helped create? Co-created. But yeah. it, this is, I mean, we can be talking for hours about, yeah. you know, so jumping, yeah. you know, 15 years. And in those 15 years, tons happened. And again, privilege, opportunity. But also, on a personal level, the celebrity thing happened where, I, I now I come from New Jersey. I do not come from an environment where you buy hype. And it's mm -hmm. just not the way I was raised, uh, quite the opposite. Like if you buy hype, someone's gonna smack you in the head and just tell you like, you know, you know get it together. Yeah. So I was very sensitive to the projection and to the amount of energy and, that I was getting. And this idealization, it made no sense to me at all. And no matter how truthful and authentic I stayed in the yoga room, I can feel this proje projection, but I can also feel the seduction of it. It's very seductive. Celebrity is very seductive. And so for me, I made sure I worked with a therapist from the very beginning to make sure I stayed really clear about the shadow of yoga and not to buy that, but at the same time to be present to that seduction. And that was a really, um, that was an interesting and challenging time because there was a moment where I realized I was going to be very successful in the community. That it was really, I, sky was the limit for me. And I knew that if I didn't take the attention off of myself and onto something else, then A, it's a misused opportunity. But I also knew that the yoga in this, there's still a yoga, that I wasn't doing my inner work, that I was 
buying into the shadow and the end result was going to have to be some sort of, you know, rug being pulled out from underneath me because I wasn't learning the lessons. Mm. So I couldn't buy like grateful, happy. This is my karma. I have to work within this and I can't be of it. So I'm grateful when people, you know, have those projections. I can hold space for it, but I do not identify with it at all all but the only reason I don't is because I still to this day have a support team to make sure that I'm processing it so it's interesting that's the exact same mo in that moment when you first became a yoga teacher you took the attention off yourself and focused on their poses and walked around yeah and it's much then more I, fun then I can engage yeah. once it was on me it, it's limited I'm limited yeah. you know I'm interesting to a point but how often can I talk about my hair products before you know, it starts getting right. a little wavery? Um, but what I care Wavy. for, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. what I care for is important. Yeah. What I believe in is important. What's possible is important. The platform I have is important. So what are these causes for those who don't know? Well, what, it, what fires you up? What gets you? Well, I have, there's, there's things that I'm passionate about yeah. personally. HIV, AIDS, advocation, um, awareness raising, um, advocacy, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking has always, I've been always very passionate about it. But I think what I'm more interested in about is helping to elevate leadership, giving people tools. Mm -hmm. So whether it's animal rights or domestic violence or politics, that someone has the tools to be able to go into these areas where there is a lot of trauma, um, where there's a lot of intensity and be able to be an activist, but from a more sustainable place, doing their inner work and also recognizing that if we're not doing our inner work and going into environments where there is trauma, we're more likely than not to traumatize someone else, creating more conflict, right. more separation. Activism, activism hasn't worked in the past because it's always me against you, us against them, and that's the opposite. It just furthers the divide. It's negative. It's yeah. against. Yeah. Rather than how do you f reframe? And well, one of your customers at uh, Life Cafe back in the day, Alan, Alan Ginsberg, said, <laughs> yeah, uh, "Aggression mean. begets aggression." Yes. Yeah. You love that Alan Ginsberg and William Burroughs used to come in. Yeah. Didn't know who they were at the time. Yeah. And figured it out. Um, they were probably among the most boring of your clients. They used to just sit across yeah. with a cup of coffee and just yeah. have these. They would sit there all day long. Yeah. Alan used to wear a hat. I remember his hat. Yeah. And just would just talk and argue and yeah. we would chit chat and yeah. didn't know who they were. Well, a final <laughs> thing. I remember the very first time I interviewed you was just on the other side of this building mm -hmm. under an aspen grove. And even then, um, you were saying, you know, when you would walk through the marketplace, everyone would try and get you to wear their stuff or give you yeah. stuff. And you said, no, ev the only things I'm going to endorse are giving to this yeah. stuff that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, endor you know, you're already kind of getting it off of you. Maybe you'd already been doing it for years at that I've point. Been, I've been doing it for as long as I could. I was, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm always uncomfortable. It, it's funny for someone who's, who's off in the center of attention, yeah. how uncomfortable I am in being the center of attention yeah. until I can deflect it. Well, I think also, you know, we, we fans, we people don't like to idolize people who are incredibly self-involved. Mm -hmm. We might like to watch them mess up and mm -hmm. we, they, they might be famous, but we might not connect with them. Yeah. And someone like yourself, if you're constantly putting it off yourself, then we can still connect because yeah. you're kind of open still. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just not, you know, I'm a yoga, I'm a yoga student. Like I believe in mm -hmm. yoga. I've been this way for a mm -hmm. long time. Just because I have this platform that I get to share this information doesn't leave me exempt from the deep inner work and from the shadow. Mm -hmm. So I'm always just conscious of what my practice is within this kind of an odd world that I have found myself in, a leader in. Yet I still have my own deep inner work and the shadow is evident everywhere and I'm always being challenged, you know, can you be authentic now? Can you be in integrity now? What about now? Will you sell out here? I remember a deal, I, uh, I was offered a deal with some car company. This is before they had a green policy. I may have told you this in another interview, mm -hmm. but they offered me a ton of money just to put my foot on the bumper of their car and hold a yoga mat and I had to turn it down, had to, didn't want to. 99% of my body, I wanted that money because I could do great things with that. But I knew if I did that, hmm. what it internally, the compromise was, is, was the, the, the value of that was much greater than whatever it was that they were offering me. But so was the difference between that and Nike that with the car company, you felt like you wouldn't be brought into a conversation where you could affect stuff? 
Uh, no, at that point, I was too visible. Uh -huh. And people at that point, it, again, it's my platform. People expect better of me at that point. They, and I remember someone, like you were saying before with Nike, someone did just, someone else, yeah. a young model, walked right into that deal. Walked away yeah. that money, and, and yeah. good for them. Yeah. It's, I can't, I can't, and I still can't. I think people trust me to, I'm, I'm teaching people to step up to the plate, step into leadership, make new choices, challenge the status quo. And if I don't, the hypocrisy is so evident that uh, I, 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 I couldn't live with that within myself. So within Off the Mat, we can't work. We have a checklist of questions and information that we have to ask every company before I can align myself with their hmm. brand. Hmm. And I've had to say no so often and turn my back to a lot of money and a lot of great opportunities yeah. because of a lot of their policies. Yeah. Challenge saying to them, I would love to work with you. Would you change this, 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 and this? What and are some of those this is just to give people an idea? Where product is made, uh -huh. uh, first and foremost, what the product is made of. The working conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The working conditions, you know, uh, just the, 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 the ethics in what's being, uh, I mean, on a physical level, what's being produced? Is it organic? Is it, just like with food, is it local? Is it resourced? In what mm -hmm. ways? So these kinds of business policies are what we are going to look at. Um, but it's mostly going to be, be in where it's made and how it's made. Um, and looking into some of the ethics within the company itself. What are their belief systems? Um, what are the things they stand for? Um, what are their environmental policies? Where do they give back? Do they have a philanthropic arm? These are the questions that we're going to ask. And so it's actually very limited what companies I can work for. And when you see me modeling for something, I don't get any of that money. That money all gets filtered back to off the mat into the world. Hmm. I don't get a dime. So how do you make your money then? What I do, uh -huh. I, you know, teaching. teaching. Yeah. So final question then, uh, since this has been a very, uh, very sh long five minutes, <laughs> yeah, right. um, five minutes is you know how can everyone watching this get involved in off the mat or in anything that you're passionate about right now well, what can people out there get involved in i think when i'm really interested in, interested right now you can always go to off the mat into the world org and find out about our leadership trainings but there are amazing leaders in the yoga community right now who are doing extraordinary work kind of in the fringe from yoga and 12 step 12 step recovery to um, yoga and, and disordered eating and body dysmorphia to youth justice, animal rights. They're really deeply invested in helping to support and create curriculum to teach people how to work within those issues more sustainably. Um, I'm interested in highlighting those leaders and giving them more of a platform. And so we have, a, on Off the Mat, we have our own trainings, both online and in person, but we also are bringing in a broader faculty and making it more accessible through online training so that people can learn about all of these different causes and crises and see what speaks to their soul at this time and learning the skills. So I'm not interested in just saying, go out there and change the world. What I'm interested in is develop, cultivate the tools so that when you do go out and change the world, you can do it in a way that is grounded, centered, meaningful, that doesn't create more oppression and opposition so that you can recognize the ways in which we contribute to things like racism, sexism, transphobia, hom homophobia, ableism, ageism. Because of our privileges, we often don't have to think about those things. And yet, when we go into environments to serve, where those people who deal with those isms, they have to think about it every day. Mm -hmm. They don't get a day off. But when we don't have to think about it and we go into those environments, bringing in our entire culture, and all the trauma that comes along with that, we actually create more harm than good, even with the best of intentions. My interest is in creating a conversation that allows us to really look at what is power and privilege? What is uh, conscious activism? How do we use our voice effectively? How do we use language in a way that doesn't continue, continually create more oppression? And how do we utilize these tools so that we actually can be of service in a way that is um, not glorified, romantic, but actually practical and useful and inclusive. Actually that's helpful. I'm, that's what I'm interested in, is yeah. just deepen, deepening this conversation and getting people comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that to me is the next step of yoga.
but it's deep work. It's scary work to take ownership of of where are your where do your biases still exist, your prejudice, and how does that show up in your conversations when you don't even have to think about it? Words we use every day, how to change that languaging. So whatever people's passion is in terms of service, they can connect with off the world in terms of off finding training yes. off the mat, yeah. off the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, yeah. This has been like three hour conversations. Awesome. We need some coffee and blankets. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, if anyone out there feels privilege, a weighty sense of privilege, the best way to unburden yourself of that is to learn how to, in a mindful, actually helpful way, mm -hmm. be of service. But I would challenge you. Yeah. Privilege, the, the weighty, what did you, the weighty, uh, the unburdening. Mm -hmm. Thank you for my privilege. Thank you, God. Mm. Amazing. Mm. Education, access, clean air, water, food. How dare I not then? Mm. Knowing I have all this privilege, how dare I not reach, connect, share, uh, recognize that most of the people in the world don't have this kind of access. Yeah. So how do I share it in some capacity? So I don't look at it as a burden. Yeah. I'm grateful. It's a burden when it's not used, when it's not used effectively, when you take it, when you take it for granted and mm. you don't recognize that by not acknowledging the privilege, you're actually complicit in creating more oppression for someone else. Because we benefit, our, I benefit on the oppression of others. For sure. So if I don't own that, I can't be an ally. Yeah. And so in the yoga community, we use this word all the time. We are one, we are one. And I believe that with my soul and we're not. We're not. There are differences that exist. There are people who have access, people who don't. There are people who live in safety and equality and people who do not. And until we recognize those differences and start to bridge that gap, we're not really practicing yoga. So I'm interested in practicing yoga and bridging that gap. And the only way you can do that is by ownership, accountability, self-responsibility, and then action. Mm. Allyship, but from love, not from guilt. That doesn't work. It's mm. never worked. Mm. Love. Yeah, I'm not talking about guilt in terms of the burden. I'm mm -hmm. saying, like in Buddhism, they say, if you want to be happy, mm -hmm. think of others first. Yeah. That includes yourself. If you want to be unhappy, think of yourself, yeah. only of yourself. Yeah. And there is some sense that so many people out there have taken that money yeah. that they thought would make them happy, and it didn't make them happy. Yeah. And if you want to be happy, yeah. you know, in Buddhism, they say service is the mm -hmm. ultimate smile. Mm -hmm. My success now makes sense to me. Like, I never understood, like, why is this all happening to me until I got into service in the way that I have and have pushed the needle in the yoga community the way that I have. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm grateful and I'm proud that I've used it in this way and that I hope I'm even more successful because the more abundance that comes my way, I will push yeah. it right back out and I've never been happier, more fulfilled, more satisfied and more grateful for yeah. the, the, the privileges and intend to keep challenging myself and my community to think bigger than the mats and to hopefully create within the yoga community constituents, a constituency of beings that through their dollar power or their voting actually makes a difference on a bigger level, on a policy level. That would be exciting. Sean Corrin, thank you so much. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I think we're up at five, six minutes. We might've gone a minute <laughs> over. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.